Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's or this afternoon's or this morning's uh, webinar on Christian Zionism. This is the fourth part in a series on Colin Chapman's new book, which I will uh, mention more in a moment. We're being hosted by Churches for Middle East Peace, a U.S. advocacy organization, a coalition of over 30 denominations working towards a just and lasting peace in the Middle East and embrace the Middle East medical Christian charity working to help specialized and vulnerable communities in the Middle East. Part one of this series focused on the biblical basis in the Old Testament and New Testament for Christian Zionism and encouraged us to read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Part two then focused on promises made to Abraham for the nation and land of Israel and the development of a new one for this in Jesus' era. And part three focused on uh, promises and interpretations in the New Testament, especially in the letter to Romans chapters 9 through 11, among other things. And tonight we have the privilege of the presence of Pastor Isaac and Richard Harvey, who will be responding to Colin's presentation over the past three weeks. And then Colin will respond briefly to each of them, and then we'll have ample time for question and answer. So I encourage you all to please put your questions not in the chat, not in the chat as we've been doing, but in the Q&A function. And then you can see each other's questions and can actually vote for the questions that you're most interested in. Um, and that will help us sort how to um, structure the Q&A time in the second half of our webinar tonight. Uh, if you have questions or concerns about that, please uh, message uh, me or the Churches for Middle East Peace in the chat function privately. Um, I also want to mention that this book that we have been discussing is available, Christian Zionism is available through, published by WIF and Stock. And um, in the chat, you'll see shortly a discount code um, that works for the US as well as UK, UK purchasers will have to pay a little bit more for shipping, uh, but we're encouraging you all to check out that text um, and to maintain the conversation in the chat. And we encourage everyone to do so with a sense of charity and kindness. Um, we're all here to learn and to, to be challenged and to seek the truth. So we want to maintain a spirit of civil civility in the chat as well. Um, now I'll briefly introduce each of our speakers. Colin, if you have been attending these series, you know, uh, is our special guest for the season, has worked for 18 years in the Middle East, where he's taught in seminaries in Cairo, Beirut, and Bethlehem. He's ordained in the Anglican Church and in the UK has taught in Bristol and Birmingham. His book, Whose Promised Land, was written in Beirut during the Civil War and was first published in 1983 with latest revision in 2015. Whose Holy City, Jerusalem and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict was also published in 2004. Richard Harvey, who will be responding first to um, Colin's presentation from the past three weeks, um, became a Jewish follower of Jesus in 1974 and studied theology at Bristol University. He pioneered the London Messianic Congregation where he met his wife, Monica, also a Jewish disciple of Yeshua. They have two children and three grandchildren. Richard served with the church's ministry among the Jewish people, was director for Jews for Jesus UK, and is presently a senior researcher. He was academic dean and director of postgraduate studies at All Nations Christian College, where he continues to teach Hebrew Bible and Jewish studies. His PhD is published as Mapping Messianic Jewish Theology, a Constructive Approach. And Lastly, we're very glad to have Munther Isaac here, Pastor Munther, who has a PhD in, from Oxford's Center for Mission Studies and is currently the academic dean of Bethlehem Bible College in Palestine and director of the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference. He is also pastor of Christmas Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bethlehem and author of From Land to Lands, From Eden to the Renewed Earth, A Christ-Centered Biblical Theology of the Promised Land. And with this, I want to thank you again all for being here and invite Richard, uh, 
to take the floor and uh, present us his response to Colin's work. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'll assume that's a yes. And uh, I'm sharing my uh, PowerPoint slide and I've started my timer. So you've asked me to address the question, how strong is the biblical basis for Christian Zionism? And I think you'll be surprised at my answer. But before I give my answer, I really want to say a very big thank you and express my gratitude that you've actually invited me to participate in this discussion. And I do not take it lightly. I'm a Jewish disciple of Jesus, a Messianic Jew, I call myself. Uh, I was very fortunate to be with Munta just a month or so ago in Bethlehem, and Munta and I have been friends for a while, and I've been friends with Colin for even longer. Uh, we were trying to work out maybe 30, 40 years. And I count it a real privilege to be given this opportunity to speak in this discussion and dialogue, which is, of course, a very controversial and a very difficult discussion to have. And often we avoid even beginning to talk to each other across these major fault lines of politics, of history, of theology, and of the suffering of two different peoples. So I want to begin with a word of gratitude. Thank you for inviting me. I hope it'll happen again. And then I want to express empathy, because when I was in Bethlehem, my dear friend Munter gave me a copy of this wonderful book. I strongly recommend it. If you haven't got a copy already, uh, please do. And uh, Munti, you signed it, I don't know if you remember, uh, to Richard, a dear friend, same kingdom. And uh, I have really taken that to heart. I count it a privilege to be your friend. I know that because we both believe in Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, our risen Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we are in the same kingdom. And yet... As I began to read this book, I was deeply overcome, I have to tell you. And if I show you the page markings, just about every page, I write, ah, or ouch, or oi. And I don't think I ever ex really realised until I started reading this book by you, the depth of pain and suffering and sorrow and uh, I just every page I was writing comments and notes I'll, I'll send them to you and on page one I said you are my brother and I am your keeper I cannot avoid the problems that you experience I said on page two you are not an obstacle or an impairment I said on page three, you exist and need to be heard. I said on page five, I apologize for the damage and hurt and pain that has been caused by the occupation. On page six, I don't know how you managed to survive. On page seven, and I'll get into my content, I don't think I can change your theology. But it runs in the deep roots of your suffering, pain and anger. But I can ask you to reflect on it in the light of meeting me as a fellow brother in Christ. On page 10 I say, how can we live together if we are on two sides divided by a wall? And as you know, I... I'm happy to come to Bethlehem at any opportunity, if I can, to meet with you and others and say, as a Jewish disciple of Jesus, I am truly sorry for the suffering, the pain and the injustice that I see in the land today. Now, 
I'm already not sounding like a Christian Zionist, and you may accuse me of being here. I'm really a Messianic Jew who believes in the fulfilment of God's ongoing promises to Israel and the Jewish people, which include the land promises. But as I engage with you, and I'm a very small minority, less than 2% of Jewish people believe in Jesus, as far as I'm aware. And Jewish people make up less than 0.00002% of the world's population. And yet Jesus is Jewish and the church is based on the death and resurrection of the Messiah of Israel. So I belong as part of the body of Christ just as, as you do. So my engagement with your arguments first has to recognise the depth of suffering and the political context in which we do our theologies. And I would be the first to admit that Christian Zionism, and there are many different ways of defining this, has often been responsible and I know you argue it continues to do so, for an imperialist, uh, demonising theology which marginalises and suppresses the voice of the Palestinian people and the voice of Palestinian Christians. I'm very sorry for that. If I could change it, I would. All I can say is, as a Messianic Jew, I resonate with the sufferings and the experience of the Palestinian people, just as I know you resonate with the sufferings and the experience that the Jewish people have been through, especially in the Holocaust. So I'm looking for a self-critical reflection on Christian Zionism, which includes repentance and reconciliation. I then go on to what I call a post-supersessionist reading of the Bible, and my hope is in the construction of a bridging theology between, if you like, a Palestinian Christian theology and a Messianic Jewish theology. And in addition to a Christian Zionism, we either need a Christian Palestinianism or a Christian anti-Zionism to dialogue with each other and create discourse. Now, the basis for Christian Zionism, how strong is it? You'll be shocked at my answer. It's very strong. But it needs to be made stronger. And I need to define what I mean by Christian Zionism. The basis is the underlying support or the foundation for an idea. And therefore, it becomes the justification and reasoning behind something. Now, I would say that the basis for Christian Zionism has been thoroughly critiqued by my good friend Colin Chapman in his book here, which again I know is, is well worth reading and recommended. And Colin takes Christian Zionists to task, especially in their exegesis of the key passages that he refers to in the book, and also particularly focusing on Ezekiel's prophecy. And Colin rightly points out the weak exegesis, the use of proof texting, the lack of hermeneutical tools, in other words, a responsible set of criteria by which we read and interpret and apply the Bible. And also he points out a set of flawed theological assumptions based on a particular theological grid. Now, I am not a Christian Zionist in the sense that I use a dispensational, premillennial, hermeneutical scheme to interpret scripture. And in fact, even though you could call me a millennialist of sorts, I want to appeal to the basis of Christian Zionism in a different way. And I will mention a book which I recommend, and Colin also refers to this book several times in his critique, The New Christian Zionism, 
And if I have to defend Christian Zionism, I want to defend an ethical, engaged, post-supersessionist reading where it recognizes that our theology and our politics are inseparable and they our politics color our reading. But it reads the whole biblical narrative in a way that begins not with the doctrine of the land and not with the doctrine of Israel, but with the doctrine of God. And I begin my justification of Christian Zionism with Christ in Zion. And for me, the heart of the question is, who is Yeshua HaMashiach? Who is Jesus Christ? And what is his relationship and his solidarity with the people of Israel in the light of his death and resurrection on Calvary? And here is where I think we go in different directions. And I remember in a taxi in, um, it was in India, wasn't it? We were at the uh, conference in Bangalore, and you said to me, I, I just read your thesis and I was congratulating you on passing your PhD. And you said, you think I'm a supersessionist, don't you? And the answer is, nobody likes to admit being a supersessionist. Even N.T. Wright would thoroughly disagree with the term. I know that Colin Chapman also would disagree with it. But as I understand supersessionism, if we do not see a continuing role for the election of Israel, the Jewish people, in the light of Jesus, the King of the Jews and the Messiah of Israel, then I as a Messianic Jew have a real problem. It's not the political problem you experience, but it is a problem. So I want to see a move from Christian Zionism to Christ, to Zionism in Christ. I want to see Sinai providing the ethical and spiritual critique of Zion that it provides in the Hebrew Bible. Jewish theologian John Levinson has his book on Old Testament theology, Sinai and Zion. You cannot have the Davidic ideology or the eschatological reign of the Messiah without the critique morally of Sinai. And that means that my time is going on very fast. So I just want to say this, that I'm looking for the building of a bridging theology. I want a dialogue across our differences that develops mutual understanding, builds empathy, demonstrates unity, and changes conflict partners into peacemakers and makes a difference. That means we have to learn our narratives and really empathize and engage with our narratives and then create a shared narrative. This was a project you and I discussed some time ago of creating a bridging narrative. I know you have many other concerns on your mind, but for me, this would be the attempt I would make to do a sort of comparative theology and construct this bridging theology in order to try and create a shared theology. Now, I'm not going to get to the end of my presentation, but I, I read the Kairos document, and I then have to accept that that is a coherent theology, and Messianic Jews need also to construct a Messianic Jewish narrative that is coherent as well. We're not going to do that now. I've taken 14 minutes already. So let me just make the appeal that we continue the discussion, that we do listen and engage with each other. And I do want to say this, that I am not a Christian Zionist, as you can work out, in the normal sense of the word. But I am a post-supersessionist Jewish believer in Jesus. And just as I believe that Jesus continues to be king of the Jews and saviour of all nations, I believe that there is an ongoing solidarity between Jesus and his people. And my way of reading the biblical meta-narrative 
is to avoid a supersessionist turn at the coming of the Messiah and the cross and resurrection at Calvary. And to say that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable and the promises. And to me, that includes the peoplehood of Israel, the Jewish people, and to along with that becomes the land promises as well. That's just the beginning of my input into what I hope will be a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Richard, thank you for that thoughtful and um, charitable uh, response. Oh, I'm, I'm apologizing for my own internet challenges and uh, Munther would love for you to respond uh, with your presentation and then Colin after that, and then we'll do Q and A. So Munther. So good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning and uh, Thank you, Richard, for your very kind and gracious words. I really appreciate it, and I don't take them lightly at all. Uh, we go a long way, and uh, it was a very pleasant surprise to see you two months ago, and I'm glad you're enjoying my book. Uh, and I look forward to reading any critique or response you post to the book, and God willing, I can, you know, maybe use that as a platform to engage with, uh, with one another. It's been a while since we've done this, so uh, it's a good opportunity. Uh, we are brothers in Christ, and that's the most important thing, uh, of course. Um, and it is a privilege not just to share this uh, podium, webinar, whatever we want to call it with you, Richard, but with uh, uh, someone who I consider a teacher and a mentor, Colin Chapman. Uh, when I first began my engagement in this topic, as a teenager, troubled by not just the political reality, but by how many interpreted the Bible in support of uh, the occupation and um, during the second Palestinian Intifada. And I wanted really to do something and study theology and understand the topic. The first book that was given to me and that I really took to heart and read and learned from was Collins, uh, Who's Promised Land. Uh, and that played an important role. Um, the strength of it is that it came from an evangelical standpoint, uh, and, uh, and I think Colin continues to help uh, many, uh, you know, in, in the biblical field uh, with the question uh, of this webinar, how biblical is the case for Christian Zionism. But I'm sure that Colin's years in uh, the Middle East surely shaped not just, you know, his perspective on things, uh, but how he read the Bible. Uh, it, it's, it's, it really makes all the difference uh, when you see things as a Middle Eastern or when you live in the land and see things through these eyes or you, you live the, 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 the events, it, it, it changes everything. And it's no secret that we Middle Eastern Christians see things differently. Uh, and that is, uh, that is a fact. Um, when people celebrate the creation of Israel as a fulfillment of prophecy or a sign of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people, to us, it's our Nakba, it's our catastrophe. We see things differently. Uh, when Christians in the United States, for example, give billions of dollars over the years uh, to settlement projects, to us, these are settlements built on our lands, lands confiscated from us. Uh, we definitely see things differently. I have people in my congregation who are going through uh, uh, fierce legal battles, ironically with the Israeli court, to keep their land of their ancestors from confiscation from settlements, whereas Christian Zionists are pouring billions of dollars and millions of dollars into these settlements. That should change the way we understand things and even read, uh, read the Bible. And so uh, I think we should all be troubled with um, Christian Zionism, especially when it supports, for example, settlements which are against the international law uh, and when they lobby for political uh, uh, decisions that are deemed from a Palestinian perspective, Palestinian Christian perspective or Middle Eastern perspective 
uh, not contributing uh, to peace. How many times did Middle Eastern Christian leaders made statements distancing themselves from the actions of Christian Zionists or urging Christian Zionists not to do things or not to say things, but uh, all in vain because they don't want to listen and they don't take these things uh, seriously. So let me give some comments in my 10 minutes on what I think of Christian Zionism. Uh, beginning with the most extreme and hardcore uh, expressions of it, uh, which, uh, which have some very serious and dangerous flaws that I I'm sure maybe even Richard will, will admit that they exist. For example, the obsession with prophecy, obsession with wars, um, uh, many times the anti-Arab, anti-Muslim attitude. Uh, as I said, political decisions and political actions in support of, sometimes even against the international law, like uh, when supporting um, uh, settlement projects. Um, to me, there is also the whole employment of God. God is on our side. God supports, God favors one nation. God takes sides based on DNA. I have a serious problem with this issue when, uh, and I've said it many times, I have a problem with terms like, or I'm, I'm not comfortable with terms like ethnic Israel because it makes God care about our DNA. Uh, I think the whole gospels are written to counter that uh, idea. One other serious flaw I have with, or challenge problem I have with Christian Zionism is the question, what about the Palestinians? What do you propose we should do? When you celebrate the creation of Israel, when, or when you say the land belongs to the Jews by divine right, or that when you speak, as Richard talked about the eternal covenant or bond between God and the Jewish people and the covenant that includes the land, the land is not empty. The land has always had people and the land today has almost as the same number of Palestinians as it has of Jews. What should we do? Should we accept to live as second class citizens as the nation state law suggests? Should we leave as some have suggested uh, we do? Uh, Christian Zionist theology by and large with few exceptions ignores that question. And when faced with it, response by demonizing the Palestinians, hence using the equations of the Canaanites and what the fate of the Canaanites in the Bible, the same with, uh, with Palestinians. Uh, this whole mentality that I spoke about in my books of colonial mentality of ignoring the presence of Palestinians, even Palestinian Christians. Um, there are not just Palestinians in the land, there is a church in the land do Christian Zionists care to consult that church, to dialogue with that church, especially when you take positions that harm our presence? But in the most part, our presence continues to be uh, ignored. I would also next argue, and that's my fourth point or third, I, I lost count, that a lot of the ex some expressions of, especially the hardcore Christian Zionists, are actually anti-Jewish. Um, and, and let's, let's face it, that a lot of the sentiments behind promoting a Palestine as a home for the Jewish people stemmed from the fact that European Christians didn't want Jews in their midst. Uh, Anti-Semitism was so strong. And the solution to the Jew, as, as they called the Jewish problem, they called the Jewish problem was a, a home in Palestine. And, and how is that a, a, a friendly Jewish theology? A lot of Christians support Israel because they want God to bless them. They make Genesis 12 to 3 as an equation of prosperity gospel. If you bless Israel, God blesses you. As such, we should bless the state of Israel. Uh, in reality, you're blessing Israel because you want God to bless you or you don't want God to curse you. Uh, the expressions of Christian Zionism that are obsessed with war, some of them teach that two-thirds of the Jews will be massacred and the other third will convert to Christianity. And then that is somehow considered a friendly theology for the Jewish people. Uh, all of this was highlighted in the recent documentary by Israeli journalist, Maya Zinstein, called Your Kingdom Come, 
uh, which you know shows a lot of the flaws in Christian Zionism from an Israeli Jewish uh, uh, perspective. Um, is that theology really good for Palestinians and Israelis? That is the question uh, we should uh, we should ask. So I encourage, uh, I recommend that documentary uh, a lot. Uh, but let me then go more into some serious issues. My problem and my biggest problem with Christian Zionism has to do with the Zionist part. Uh, because let's face it, the Zionism that we have today in the land, uh, Zionism today is an exclusive oppressive ideology. Now I know that there are many attempts to redeem Zionism, to propose a counter narrative. But the Zionism that defines my reality is the Zionism of the occupation. And I judge Zionism by the results. Uh, the results that we've seen, not just in the military occupation of our land that has been going on for years, but also uh, in the nation state law, which passed a few years ago, which uh, in the constitution now or by law, discriminates against non-Jews uh, in statements like the right for self-determination in the land of Israel is exclusive to the Jewish people only. So this is the Zionism of today that we're talking about, a Zionism that has led to a reality on the ground that more and more human rights organizations, legal organizations are describing using words like apartheid, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, Harvard um, uh, School of Law, Al Haq, and many others. This is the real. This is the reality on the ground that I think those Christians who say we are Christian Zionists must be uh, must take to heart and must be faced with the idea that the Zionism they are supporting today is not an ethereal, you know, uh, uh, ideal vision of a of a just you know homeland for the Jewish people, but it's translated into a political system that has been oppressing other people for years. And you have to give a response and an account to that. Uh, and as such, you know, how can Christians defend that? That is the question. Uh, how can Christians defend that, especially when it's happening uh, in the name of the Bible? And as such, my answer to the question uh, and I hope I don't come across as too strong, but maybe I should. My response to the question, how strong is the biblical basis for Christian Zionism? Uh, and this might shock you, might come is how strong is the biblical basis for injustice? How strong is the biblical basis for apartheid, for military occupation? Because that is what Zionism is to me. Um, and as I said, people can talk about different versions of Zionism. People can say that's not them, but that's what Zionism is uh, to us as, uh, as Palestinians. Uh, and I don't say these things lightly. And I think a lot of the times when we argue on the Bible and Christian Zionism, uh, those who know my writings uh, see that I've spent a lot of time studying Romans 9 to 11, Galatians 3, um, Genesis 12, we've debated these issues. We've talked about election, what it means. Uh, I've done debates. I've done responses. Uh, and a lot of time I wonder, are we putting our energy in the wrong place? And as I say in my book, I found most of my answers in the Sermon on the Mountain, um, where God challenges us to seek justice. Jesus challenges us to be thirsty for justice and peace. And I don't want to undermine Colin's book or my previous writings, but I want to put them in the right context. If our theology does not serve justice and peace, there's something foundationally wrong with that theology. And this continues to be my biggest critique of Christian Zionism. My vision continues to be for a shared land for Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, uh, I, I dream of a day in which my children will have Israeli Jewish friends. That is not possible today because of the political reality 
And that's where we should focus our energy and discussion in, in, in putting an end to. Um, and so as we um, spend time and energy discussing the Bible, uh, what it means, let's not keep, let's not forget what is really at stake. Uh, at stake is the livelihood and future of millions of people. And if our interpretations and exegesis do not lead us to, 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 to the place of the question, how can we bring both together? I think we're putting our energy uh, in, the wrong, uh, in the wrong place. And again, I think that, is, that remains the biggest flaw of 99.9% .9 of Christian Zionist uh, or Christian Zionism, that it is not a theology of peace or justice. 15 minutes. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. And I look forward to uh, engaging with questions uh, or comments from the both of you. Munter, thank you so much for that thoughtful and, and honest response to this. <laughs> you were perfect. You were perfect. Uh, it's so impressive with the time today. Um, Colin, I'd like to invite you to just respond to, um, however you, you see fit for a few minutes and then I invite everyone to be thinking of questions. We'll have lots of time for Q and A in, in just uh, a few minutes. Um, so thank you, <clears throat> Richard and Mondo, for your responses. Uh, let me go back to my very first session where I def gave a simple definition of Christian Zionism, support for Zionism in the state of Israel that is based on a particular interpretation of the Bible. And it seems to me that Richard, that you cannot avoid um, being labeled as a Christian Zionist on my very, very simple, minimal definition. Um, in my first session, I deliberately pointed out that I was addressing restorationism. I hardly said a word about dispensationalism. And I agree totally with McDermott in his book, where he points out that his new Christian Zionism has nothing to do with dispensationalism. So the whole thrust of my book was to address the biblical basis uh, of Christian Zionism. And let me say also, Richard, I was really hoping to hear a detailed response from you uh, to some of my biblical interpretation in the book and in the first three sessions. Um, I really would like to know how you understand uh, the biblical, the, the Old Testament texts, looking forward to Gentiles being brought into Israel. I'd love to hear how you respond to my interpretation of Luke 24 and the walk to Emmaus. The disciples are expecting that Jesus is going to accomplish the redemption of Israel, a political restoration of the Jewish state. And Jesus says to them, you fools, he challenges their ideas. Um, I've suggested that Luke 24 and Acts 1 are crucial texts marking a turning point in the thinking of the disciples. Um, I've also in the book and in the third presentation uh, gave a, a detailed exposition of Romans 9 to 11. And Richard, I spent this afternoon watching a YouTube presentation that you gave in Vienna a few years ago, giving your interpretation of Romans 9 to 11. I look forward to hearing a detailed response <laughs> from you to what I've written. On the subject of supersessionism, um, I've told you dozens of times that I repudiate the title, I, I repudiate replacement theology. If according to Romans 11, I, as a Gentile believer, have been grafted into the olive. If I have been grafted into Israel, and if unbelieving Jews are like branches that have been broken off, how can you possibly label this as supersessionism? In my understanding, this is incorporation. Gentiles are incorporated into Israel. So how can Israel possibly remain the same, A, when Gentiles are grafted into Israel, and B, when unbelieving Jews are like the branches that are broken off? 
So I really challenge your understanding of the continual role of Israel. Israel has to change if Gentiles are incorporated into it and if unbelieving Jews are broken off. Um, on the history and the politics, Richard, you and I have had many debates on the subject. I remember at All Nations giving you a copy of Elan Papi's book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, and how uncomfortable you are with that very title. But I have often pressed you on these political issues. I've often asked you what you think of the occupation, which most of the world believes is illegal in international law. And I, I really find it hard to think of how you are going to construct this kind of bridging theology um, unless you actually address the situation on the ground, uh, which Munther is describing so, um, so, so pointedly and, and, and so movingly. Kevin, over to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe. We, we just have a couple of questions so far. So I wonder if maybe Richard, you just, if you want to respond to any of that and then we can yeah. jump into those questions. I, I will. Um, right, I don't know quite where to begin, but because of the questions and because of Colin and Munter's um, points, uh, let me try and answer them in, in this order. How strong is the basis for Christian Zionism? What is supersessionism and what do I make of the occupation? Can I do that? So how strong is the biblical basis for Christian Zionism? Uh, I've said it's very strong. And the reason I'm saying that is I, I'm, I'm trying, I suppose, to change the discourse on either being Christian Zionist or anti-Christian Zionist. So I say, how strong is the basis for Christian Zionism? And my answer is very strong because the Bible is not just the basis, but the whole construction. A basis is something that you build and then build on top of that. But the building is something that you live in. So a basis without a structure has no purposes and a structure without a basis has no foundation. And when I read what I call the biblical canonical narrative, reading it as Old Testament theologian Walter Brueggemann says, with the grain rather than against the grain, in other words, reading it in the way that I think the whole biblical narrative fits together, I'm wanting to hold on to the ongoing election of the Jewish people of Israel, even, dear Colin, in unbelief, in relation to the uniqueness of Christ, that Yeshua, Jesus, is the King of the Jews, that Jesus has not abandoned his people, even though we have not accepted him, and we have not been faithful to the covenant, and in a way that maintains what I call the ecclesial, ethical, and eschatological aspects of election in Christ. By ecclesial, I mean that the church is made up of the natural branches and the unnatural branches, Romans 9 to 11, the ecclesia a circumcisione, the church from the circumcision, and the church from the uncircumcision and we are there to demonstrate a reconciled unity in the body of Christ. The ethical dimension of that I come very much to the criticisms that Colin and, and Munter rightly say I have to be critically aware and reflective of the injustices that have been perpetrated on the Palestinian people by the state of Israel. I'm not denying that. I am still, however, a Jewish person who sees themselves as part of, the, of Israel. And when we talk about Zionism, I'm not just talking about a political ideology. And this is, again, 
a, a, a defining issue for me as a Jewish follower of Jesus. For me, the land of Israel and even the state of Israel has a significance for me as a Jew. I know that I don't live in Israel and Munter is absolutely right. You know, I, I'm not part of that context, but I'm part of the Jewish people. And we've been here for thousands of years. And we began with Abraham. We've survived the Holocaust. We're still here. And I'm a Jewish follower of the Messiah. So, and I'm looking for the future eschatological aspects of that because I do believe in the fulfillment of prophecy and that eventually not only will all Israel be saved, which I take to mean the totality of the Jewish people, but Israel will also be a place of pilgrimage for all nations. Now, I also wanted to just briefly define supersessionism as that's the thing that I'm accusing Colin of and Munter and uh, I need to just say what I mean by that, even though it may be denied by my dear friends here. I want to read the canonical meta-narrative, the whole story of scripture, in a way that is faithful to the ongoing election of Israel in Christ. And the God of Israel and Christian theology is the key text I would recommend anyone to read by R. Kendall Sulan. And he there says uh, that supersedere comes from the Latin to sit above or be superior to and therefore to replace or set aside. And supersessionism can be defined as the traditional Christian belief that the church has taken the place of the Jewish people and that God's covenant with the Jews is now over and done, or rather renewed and transformed in such a way that it applies to the whole church but the significance of Israel as a people has now been evaporated or spiritualized or universalized and therefore there is no particularity remaining to the election of Israel as the Jewish people. It's an interpretation that implies the abrogation, the, the, court, the um, renouncing or the obsolescence of God's covenant with the Jewish people. And Kinder Solon takes on a, a, a meaning to this which says the way we read the whole story of scripture is the way that we then slot into place these different passages that Colin has mentioned, Luke 24, Acts 1 and uh, Romans 9 to 11. So I do want to respond to Colin just by saying I do not read these passages in the way that you do. And I'm bringing some theological assumptions into the passages, which I think are a better way of reading scripture. Now, the exegesis that you follow, Colin, is following the lines of Augustine, Calvin, uh, and others, who are really, I would say, arguing against the grain of scripture in a way that goes against the possibility of these meaning that Israel has any ongoing significance. And the passages you mentioned from Luke 24 and Acts 1, I disagree with your use of Calvin here. I disagree with the implication that you read into these passages that Jesus is not planning for the restoration of Israel and that the disciples are so completely wrong in their understanding. And my friend Mark Kinzer, who contributes a chapter in the book The New Christian Zionism, has written another book which is called The Death and Resurrect Jerusalem uh, Destroyed Jerusalem Raised, something like that, where he argues that New Testament scholars in a different tradition to the one that you and Munter are situated in actually see this as a delay in the parousia and a delay in the return of Yeshua, but nevertheless the sense of the restoration 
of the kingdom to Israel through the risen son of David. Now, I should stop talking now because I'm sure that the others will want to disagree with me. But I also just want to mention Romans 9 to 11 as you've brought that up. And I'm right now in Vienna, by the way. I'm at, a, I'm at a, another conference where I'm not simply listening to my interpretation of Romans 9 to 11, but to leading systematic theologians and biblical scholars uh, in, in the academy, not just Messianic Jews, who are reading Romans 9 to 11 in a way that affirms the ongoing solidarity of Yeshua, Jesus, with his people. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. I too am an Israelite. And I think you have to admit that there are different ways of reading the whole biblical narrative. And I'm not just trying to pick verses out of context. I'm trying to recognize an assumption here, which is the ongoing election of Israel. So even the, par the olive tree metaphor, we shouldn't push that metaphor beyond its intention. But the metaphor is of a natural olive tree with some branches broken off so that the unnatural branches come in and give nourish, nourishing life to the olive tree. And then the natural branches will be grafted back in again. And like Augustine, you might say, well, this will only happen at the very end of time, the return of Christ and the eschaton. But even the olive tree metaphor, an agricultural metaphor, which is not designed to bear the weight of a full systematic theology of supersessionism or even of, of um, dispensationalism, that olive tree metaphor talks about the eventual regrafting in of the natural olive branches. And Paul's message is that the natural, the unnatural should not boast over the natural and say they were cut off so that we might be grafted in, nor should the natural boast over the unnatural. And in fact, the mystery of the ecclesia is that Israel is still in unbelief, a partial hardening. And yet one day that partial hardening will be softened. And that will be life from the dead. And if we don't accept that, I think we've lost sight of the return of Yeshua, the return of Jesus, to consummate his prophesied purposes. Now, I have to say to Munta, I realize that this is rhetoric and discourse, which means almost nothing to you because of the context in which you're in. And Munta, I found myself wanting to write a letter to your 16-year-old self when you got that original assignment about how could Israel be still the elect people of God or something like that. I wanted to say it's all about God. It's all about his promises. And he called Israel not to be special or different in a way that was superior, but in a way that was, to, as you say, to be representative. And then for the universal to join the particular, the new, the renewed Israel includes the Gentiles, the nations. But the Gentiles do not become Jews. And although the terminology is, is complex, Paul, I think, looks for a broader understanding of Israel but he includes in Israel the Ecclesia a Circumcisione, the Church of the Circumcision. And that remnant is a prophetic foreshadowing of the full number of Israel, just as the full number of Gentiles will come in. I'll stop there. I hope I haven't gone on too long. Thank, thank you, Richard. Um, we, we have a few more questions in the chat now, but I'd love... To invite you, Munther, or, and then Colin, if you'd like to, to respond to that. And particularly, there is a question about defining supersessionism. So if either of you would like to reiterate or clarify well, your, your understanding of what supersessionism is, if that's a worry for you, yeah. Um, Can I, uh, yeah, supersessionism. <laughs> supersessionism to me is a word thrown by a lot of Christian Zionists to end any argument. 
Sadly, sadly, Richard, I, I know that's not how you use it. A lot of times people just throw in words. And, and what, really di- what really disappoints me or frustrates me about how supersessionism is used or labels are put on us in the sense that are people reading us? Uh, and supersessionism is, 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 you know, you make definitions and you impose them on us and you insist that we behave and interpret the Bible in a certain way, whereas this is not what we're saying, this is not what we're trying to do, and I'm not trying to answer the questions you're asking. Uh, for example, you know, we would never, I think me and Colin would say, God is done with the Jewish people. You know, we never say that. Uh, our argument, at least my argument, I don't know what, I, I'm sure Colin is, is that when Paul says God is not with the Jewish people, he means they can still believe in the Messiah. When God says God is not done with the Jewish people or with Israel, when Paul says that, I don't think he's saying, wait 2,000 years later, they will come back to the land and establish a secular state. This is where we disagree. But we would never say God. And, and the reason I say God is never done with the Jewish people is, again, I don't think God is racist. <laughs> God opens his, his doors his, his, you know, to everyone. He doesn't care about my race, about my ethnicity when he says. So what frustrates me about the discussion on supersessionist or when I am described as supersessionist is that people make up these dis- definitions and then begin judging us and labeling us based on these definitions without actually reading or listening to what we're saying. Uh, you mentioned some statements like Gentiles do not become Jews or, or so on. Y- you know, Paul writes to say that Gentiles share the same inheritance with the Jews. In other words, he's trying to say they become members of the same household of Israel. Now, I don't know what you mean by that statement, Gentile don't become Jews. Let me tell you how I read the Bible. Abraham is my father. Moses is my father. David is my father. I became part of that family. And if we want to make things more complicated, uh, and if that's the idea, you know, a lot of Palestinians actually are of Jewish descent. What do you make of them? You know, two of my good Palestinian Christian friends made the DNA test and you know, th- that's the, th- to, you know, that's what I think, are, are we really talking about ethnicity and DNA to solve the conflict or even circumcision? Whereas Paul 2000 years late ago was trying to tell us these things don't matter to God. Gentiles and Jews share the same inheritance. They are members of the same household as Christ. In Christ, we are one. And now we're, we're, we're insisting on making that distinction. Whereas I think Paul would be insisting on not making that uh, that distinction. Otherwise, you know, we will make a distinction between free and slave as well, uh, because that's that's what Paul says about male and female, free and slave, and and Jews uh, or uh, or Gentiles. Uh, so that's how I would uh, answer some of you know you you said so many good points that one just want to uh, to respond. Uh, I saw other questions, but um, I'll give it to Kevin if he wants me to talk on some of the question in the chat or, or just stop here. Thank, thank you, Mother. We, we do have a number of questions in the chat now. Um, just want to give Colin you another minute to respond to any of this and then <clears throat> move forward with those. Very briefly, um, I love the Brueggemann expression, reading against the grain of scripture, but to read it according to the grain of scripture, to me, is reading the Old Testament through the eyes of the New Testament. To me, this is reading scripture in the right way, through the eyes of the New Testament. Um, and again, responding to what Richard has said about Israel. Um, Richard, I think of myself as being part of Israel. Theologically, according to the New Testament, as a Gentile believer in Jesus, as Mandela said, I'm a descendant of Abraham. I am incorporated into Israel. Um, Richard, if I could use an illustration. I, I'm not a golfer, but um, in this country, in the past, there's been many golf clubs that are exclusively for men. 
um, and there has often been campaigns for, for women to women to join. Um, and in many cases, they've been successful. I can imagine some of the debates that went on among the men. We can't have these women joining a men's club. Oh, if they join, let's allow them to be honorary members or associate members. But if they became members, they became full members with all the rights and privileges of belonging to that golf club. Now, if I may say so, the way you speak, it, it makes the Jewish community a very exclusive club that we Gentiles are not allowed to enter, or if enter at all, it's only as honorary members or associate members. But I think of myself as, a, theologically, as part of Israel. You mentioned Solane's book, and you told me about this book about 10 or 12 years ago, and I sent you a very detailed three-page response to it. So I still do not accept his definition of supersessionism and do not accept, because of what I've said about my understanding of the relationship with Israel, I've not taken the place of anybody. I've been grafted into this people. So there's no replacement or supersession in that. Thank you, Colin. There, there have been a couple of questions about what is a Jew, what is Israel, and, um, and a third related question about whether a Messianic Jew require, being mess, a Messianic Jew requires one to be a Christian Zionist. Um, so I'd like to, we've kind of touched on all of this already, but if anyone has a further comment on that, uh, this would be a good time for that, since there's a lot of interest in that. Can I comment? Uh, I'll just say, um, what is a Jew or who is a Jew? And the answer is Jesus is a Jew. And the incarnation of the Son of God into human life was as a first century Palestinian Jew. Now, how and why did God decide to become human and to take on Jewish flesh? And Karl Barth particularly emphasizes that Jesus did not simply become a human, but he became a Jew. And the Jewishness of Jesus is really the basis for why I believe in God's ongoing purposes and continuity for Israel today. Now, Jesus could not be born a Jew were it not for the existence of the Jewish people. And that begins with Abraham, who, is a, who becomes, if you like, the first convert or is the first Jew. And therefore, the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which then becomes the 12 tribes and then becomes the kingdom of Israel, and then the line of David, Yeshua Hanotsri, Jesus of Nazareth, is born into that line. Now, the question is, does the Jewish people still have any relevance today in the light of the coming of Christ? And I'm grateful that Munter and Colin seem to affirm that. But the type of inclusion of the nations that they see, in my mind, does a disservice to the creation purposes of God in making us male and female in God's image. And I would say Israel and the nations as part of God's creation purposes. Now, some would argue, no, the nations and the creation of Israel are a result of the sin and the fall, but that's not the only option. And there is a minority view from William of Ockham and others in the Middle Ages that that is not the case. So I see the variation between male and female and the variation between Israel and the nations as part of the purposes of God. So just to finish that, Messianic Jews, we are part of Israel and we are part of the church. 
And I do not need to boast or assert superiority by saying I didn't choose my parents, I was born Jewish, because my parents are Jewish, both of them, are, all my family are Jewish. I didn't really want to become a believer in Yeshua, in Jesus, but I was overpowered by a revelation of the love of God and I, I had no other option. So here I am, a Jewish disciple of the Jewish Messiah Yeshua. I express myself as a Messianic Jew, as a member of both the church and of Israel. And my theology, I hope, is a holistic theology that takes into account what that means. And therefore, the ongoing purposes of God for the Jewish people, which include the covenants and the land, and I would say include Jerusalem and the temple, have yet to be fully realised. They have to be realised in justice and in peace. And Munta, I'm very happy to say that is not the situation now. And I, I would strongly repudiate the injustices and the sufferings. I would say it's not just Israel's fault. It's not just the Zionists' fault. It's part of the global interaction of superpowers in history i blame particularly the british uh, and a few others as well and we are part of a very cause a, a very geopolitical mess and you and i we are in the minority of all the minorities and you are even more of a minority in your situation than i am in a way you're two percent of the palestinian people i'm less than two percent of the jewish people but you're living in a land under occupation, and I deeply regret that. And if there's anything I can do in just maintaining a dialogue with you and trying to keep communication, I would love to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, transitioning a little bit, Munta, there's a couple of questions in the chat that would be great for you to respond to. Um, one is asking you how you um, and religious authority react when you make incontrovertible points and if they have so if you could share a little bit of your experience um, advocating for the Palestinian people and then there's a, a further question about which I think might be related in well, bridging the narrative how is the practice of apartheid addressed and how do Palestinians Christians and Muslims factor into this narrative how is this narrative so Feel free to respond to either of those how you how you see fit. Yeah. Um, so how yeah. do religious leaders? I, I assume we're talking about Christian uh, religious leaders, right? Uh, I don't know who asked the question, but um, we have all sorts of uh, on the spectrum, you know. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, in question here, we're talking about, for example, some of the very strong Christian Zionists actually don't uh, care to listen or we don't have any communication uh, with them. So that's on the extreme, you know, one extreme side, people who don't want to listen. Um, there are people who um, think it's unfortunate uh, and then do nothing and uh, um which I think, and I say a lot in my books and talks, it's a typical reflection of the of a lot of religiosity that we find in all religions when we turn apathetic to suffering and just say it's unfortunate uh, and not take our role in trying to end that uh, suffering. Um, and then there is the a big group who want to engage. Uh, sometimes they don't agree with what we say uh some some try to go but what does the bible say isn't this fulfillment isn't this part of god's plan isn't this land belong to the jews so we go into these debates um and and, and as i said in my talk i always try to bring the question into the realm of justice and the reality of the ground because that's where to us it's it really matters uh, uh it matters the most um, but over the last year or so, or two years, um, a lot of the debates I've been having has to do with how we describe the reality. Is it helpful? Should we use such terms? You're not being, you know, uh, that, you know, some, some think I'm too aggressive. Uh, some think, you know, you should 
soften the language and talk about peace, not just end the occupation or, um, uh, or so on. And on the other hand, there are those who decide to take the path of we want to bring justice to the Palestinian. We will do our uh, best and we will even put uh, pressure on, on, on governments. Um, but really, it's really becoming more and more difficult to deny the reality on the ground, uh, Kevin. Uh, and I don't know who asked that question. It's really becoming more and more difficult to defend what Israel is doing. Uh, or to defend uh, or to speak of, of um, a different version of Zionism because the reality on the ground speaks volume. And as I said, just the last year alone, how many reports we've said describing the reality as, uh, as apartheid. And so my, our question now has turned into, and this is the question I am asking people I meet all the time who engage in this question, what is your response to these studies? Um, and, you know, as I said, many times we want to talk about the Bible and how we interpret it and so on. Uh, but I want to push on church leaders to the response. What is your response to answer the question? What is your response to these studies, to the reality on the ground? And what will you do about it? Um, and questions vary. Uh, I mean, answers vary. Uh, and I think... Uh, as I've written recently, you know, history will judge. Uh, history will, will not be merciful. Uh, and uh, the, the powerful thing of these studies is that people can no longer say we did not know. Uh, people can no longer say we did not know. So, Yeah. Can I respond to Munta? Sure. We'd love yeah. a, a brief response so we can get to some other questions. Yeah. Munta, yeah. I, I have no problem with using the term apartheid. I, my father grew up in South Africa. He left South Africa, came to the UK, but he was always very concerned to see justice in South Africa. I, I understand the use of the term apartheid. It's a slogan, it's, it's a smear, but it's also a reality that you experience. When I read your chapter, ignored, discredited and dehumanized, I felt so... I, I wept because I know that you have experienced what I would call a, a PTSD, a political and theological stress disorder of feeling so victimized in a way that I know my people were in the Holocaust. Now, I want to do all I possibly can to let your voice be heard. I need it for my own Messianic Jewish theology and movement to be humanized by the cries of the Palestinian Christians. I, I, I really beg you to just keep this discussion going because I want my brand of Messianic Judaism and even my brand of new Christian Zionism to be so ethically engaged that we stand against injustice. I also know that you're unlikely to agree with my theological grid. But I want us to work towards what I would call a bridging narrative, a bridging theology. And how do we bridge our narratives across walls and across asymmetries of power? Well, those in the, this is Elan Pape's position, and Colin, I did read the book, and I do accept much of his argument. I don't always like the emotional cladding that the argument is expressed in, but I, I understand the asymmetries of power. We have to step over the wall, and we have to go the second mile in any way we can. And I would simply ask Munta not to give up, and, and not to think it's all useless, because actually, if we could do something together, that would broaden the voices and bring more light and less heat into these discussions. And my hope is, is that you will continue to do so. Thank you, Richard. Um, Munther and, and Colin, there are um, a couple of questions in the chat that ask about eschatology and um, 
One suggests that Jewish eschatology tends to focus on the horizontal, this world, and Christian um, eschatology focuses on vertical, the inbreaking of a new world, um, crediting this idea with Balthazar. And um, then there's another couple of questions that focus more on ethics. So one uh, quotes, um, what does the Lord require of you but to love justice and to seek mercy? And another asks for a, a simplified explanation of the, the dangers of Christian Zionism. So I wonder if you'd like to respond to either of those or to this kind of dichotomy of eschatology and ethics, which I think is one of the themes and ways people can talk past each other in this conversation. Yeah. Um, you want to talk? Uh... Um, if I may, yes. Um, on, on the question of eschatology, I would suggest that Romans 9 to 11 is not actually giving a comprehensive eschatology about the future of the Jewish people. Paul's main concern in those chapters is to correct wrong attitudes of Christians towards the Jewish people. God's finished with the Jewish people. And Paul says he hasn't finished with the Jewish people. But when we come to Romans 11, 25 and 26 and so on, the mystery to me is an open secret. The mystery in the New Testament language is not something that is concealed and mysterious. It's an open secret. The mystery that Paul's talking about there is about Gentiles being incorporated into Christ so that all Israel means the fullness of Jew, Jew, the Jewish people and the fullness of Gentiles coming together in the body of Christ. To me, Paul is not outlining an eschatology. Yes, he is hoping that Jews will continue in larger numbers to come and believe in Jesus the Messiah, but I don't think he's presenting an eschatology about what's going to happen in the end of days. He's more concerned to correct wrong attitudes at that particular time in that context. And I'm sorry, I didn't get the hang of the other questions you were asking. The, the other couple of questions were about the ethical side of the occupation. One was quoting, um, what does the Lord God require of you but to love justice and to walk in mercy? And another question was asking for a simplified version of the ethical dangers of Christian Zionism, uh, Over particularly to for Palestinians. Yeah. Over to Munder. So um, it's interesting. I'm reading the eschatology question again. Um, and it's interesting. I don't think of, of you know, in, in my understanding of the Bible, I don't think of a Jewish eschatology uh, that's opposed to a Christian eschatology. I think, you know, the, the Christian hope is deeply embedded in, in the creation, redemption, and, and, and so on. And, and it's, it's a biblical hope of the prophets as well. So I think it's the same. Um, uh, at least, you know, Hebrew scripture, eschatology, if we want to use that distinction, is the same. Um, I think the, the difference is that we as Christians, or at least in my understanding, I, I believe in, in the realized eschatology as already in the kingdom of God, though not yet completed. So yes, it is being fulfilled. But it's not as if we're talking about two different end results. Uh, now, how does that tie to uh, ethics and justice? I think the question, the answer to me is that knowing what the end result is, knowing what, what God's vision for creation, the biblical shalom, biblical peace, uh, the redemption of the universe of people, people of every tribe, tongue, and nation come under one umbrella, uh, this beautiful vision, whether we read it in Revelation 21, 22, or uh, Isaiah uh, 55 and onward. So if we know that that's where things are moving towards, that I think that becomes our mandate. Uh, our hope becomes our mandate. What we hope for, the things we hope for, should become the things we work for. Um, and, and that's, you know, is translated into, into action. My, my good 
colleague and friend, Reverend Mitri Rahib, has always continues to say, hope is what we do today. Uh, in the sense that, you know, we know God's will. And uh, what troubles me about uh, a lot of Christian Zionists is that they are obsessed in trying to guess what will happen in the future. Whereas, you know, we know what God wants from us now. And that takes me to the question, what does the Lord require of you? So we should move on with the verse to do justice and seek mercy. Um, and what does that mean? Uh, and, and I think... It, in, in many circles, there is a flaw uh, in, 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 in the Christian thinking in that justice doesn't play a serious or a, a central role in our theology. And it baffles me because justice is so central in the Bible, especially in the Hebrew scripture. Uh, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of justice and peace. Uh, uh, justice and mercy should be at the core of what we do. And that's, you know, I keep mentioning the Sermon on the Mountain. Um, blessed are those who are thirsty for righteousness. We should be hungry and thirsty, Aitash, thirsty for righteousness. Uh, that's what God requires of us. And, and I think it's the righteousness revealed in the kingdom of God that, you know, impacts every, uh, every aspect of, uh, of our life. Um, just to simplify things, uh, there was a question in Silpem terms about the Christian Zionism and what's the problem with it and so on. Uh, one way Palestinians challenge Christian Zionism is in the simple question, what is the gospel to the Palestinians in the theology of Christian Zionism? It's non-existence, it's a nightmare. Um, and in opposition, we should ask, you know, is this what God, is this what God wants to see when he looks at our land. Uh, and if we know what God's desire is for our land, we should do that. We should be his agents in trying to implement that uh, today. And that's how I tie, you know, all these questions together. I don't know if that worked, but. That's perfect. Thank you, um, There's There's a few more questions in the chat, but as we're coming to a close, it's just a couple more minutes and very grateful for everyone's time this evening. I um, want to ask uh, each of you to respond to this uh, question. What is your vision or what do you think God's vision is for the land of Israel and Palestine? And perhaps your hopes or your dreams or your understanding of God's vision for this land. Uh, I'm going to look for a quote. So if someone else wants to begin, and I'll look yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Richard, you're muted, but it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, reconciliation. reconciliation that brings justice and peace and security. And without reconciliation, then it, it's just going to continue as a violent, long-term, intractable conflict and get worse. So we have to have peace. And eschatology actually should never be separated from ethics. Karl Barth said that Christianity is all about eschatology and eschatology should lead to our behavior changing. It shouldn't just be fortune telling or trying to predict the future. We've got to be ethically engaged. But as well as ethics and eschatology, I, I have to re-emphasize the doctrine of election because I think for me, this is again the core of our theological differences, that I see the ongoing election of Israel as the Jewish people. I see an enlarged Israel with the incorporation of the nations, so that the church is made up. We are co-heirs, co-partners, co-inheritors. But it's in the purposes of God that the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, the King of the Jews, comes to restore the kingdom, and this is a universal kingdom which maintains both the particular and the universal in attention. But I, I agree, justice is the symbol of, of the right and the righteousness of God, which are what we are looking for in the land of Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, I, if I could give a very Please. quick answer. Um, Please. I think as, as Munda he said, he really believes that it is possible. His, his hope is 
that Jews and Palestinian, Israelis and Palestinians can live side by side, sharing the land together as equal partners. Um, and it's fine to present that as a vision, but sooner or later, you've got to get down to the realities of the present situation. I would say, as many people have been arguing for years, that the two-state solution has been dead in the water for a long, long time. In my understanding, the only way forward is for one kind of one state in which all the inhabitants of the land have equal rights and find some political formula that enables them to live side by side. I have to say, Richard, I sometimes feel a little frustrated with your eschatology because it does not actually address the situation on the ground at the present time. Um, and I, I would love to hear you actually say that the occupation is illegal and that it needs to be undone. Uh, so it's fine to have visions about the future, but how do they relate to the present situation? Thank you. And then and can, I, can I say something in the end? Okay. Um, yes, we'll give you the last I, word and Colin can respond, summarize if he likes at the end, please. No, uh, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, as much as I agree with Colin about, you know, his last comments that, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, your theology frustrates uh, uh, me, uh, Richard, or I disagree with it and, and so on. And I, I would echo Colin's words. Uh, I think I also would, you know, speak for Cal Colin, say that, you know, we appreciate you. And I, I personally love you as a brother uh, in Christ. And we will continue this, uh, no doubt about this. Um, so even with these sometimes strong disagreements, uh, I, I love the question. So let me share my response to the question about the vision. Uh, and this is how I usually end my most of my presentations. Um, and I've been talking about this for years now. Sharing the land is my vision. Sharing the land as opposed to dividing it. Dividing comes from the mentality of power. It's the powerful who divide and gives less territory to the weaker. It's the powerful who divides and communicates that we cannot get along with those who are different than us. And that I disagree with. Um, and so in this, this ideology of, or theology of sharing, uh, uh, there should be no second-class citizens, no occupation, no apartheid, but the same rights, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, or religion. <clears throat> we live here as Palestinians and Israelis. We would be stupid to think that there is any other way other than sharing this land. Or if we think we can get along with systems of separation and division uh, and so on. Um, and I would like to conclude with a few quotes from the Kairos Palestine document. Uh, and I think um, they the very fitting to end with. Uh, through our love, this is from Kairos Palestine, we will overcome injustices and establish foundations for a new society, both for us and for our opponents. Our future and their future are one. Either the cycle of violence that destroys both of us uh, or peace that will benefit both. Um, even though we have fought one another in the recent past and still struggle today, we are able to love and live together. We can organize our political love with all our political life with all its complexity according to the logic of this love and its power. And I would like to underline the coming sentence after ending the occupation and establishing uh, justice. And keep in mind, these words are coming from the people who are oppressed, who are living under occupation. Uh, but this remains our, uh, our desire. And the final quote from Kairos Palestine, our land uh, is God's land, uh, as is the case with all countries in the world. It is holy in as much as God is present in it, for God alone is holy and sanctifier. It is the duty of those who live here to respect the will of God for this land. It is our duty to liberate it from the evil of injustice and war. 
It is God's land, and therefore it must be a land of reconciliation, peace, and love. This is indeed possible. God has put us here as two peoples, and God gives us the capacity, if we have the will, to live together and establish in it justice and peace, making it, in reality, God's land. Quoting Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live uh, in it. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a great note to end on. Um, and Colin, if I uh, want to, we, we're over our time now, but just want to give you a, a brief moment to summarize the, the series, or we want to extend your sincere gratitude for doing this with CMAP and Embrace. Thank you. Um, I, I'm so glad that in this last session, we, we have been talking about the history and the realities on the ground. Um, the, the, the title of the whole series was How Strong is the Biblical Basis for Christian Zionism? So I deliberately set out to concentrate on biblical interpretation rather than the history and the politics, but it's inevitable that we stray into the history and the politics and the present realities on the ground. Um, but it, I think this session has reminded me that this kind of discussion probably has to go on um, in the future. Um, Richard, I have responded to things that you've written. I've responded in great detail to McDermott's volume, um, and I'm waiting to have a response to what I've written. Um, and, and we actually can't get away from detailed discussion of interpretation of particular texts. Um, I know it's tiresome and people would much rather talk about the justice issues and the political issues, but someone at some time um, has got to get together and deal with the biblical basis because let's face it, it is the theology underlying what Richard has been talking about it's the theology underlying Christian Zionism that is a major factor that has led to the conflict, uh, the ongoing conflict over so many years. So, yes, we do have to address the realities on the ground. But among Christians, among people of faith, people who believe in scripture, there has got to be some very detailed discussion about the theology and about biblical texts. Um, and I hope that Embrace and CMEP will be able to think of some ways of continuing this dialogue. It's probably not possible in a 75 minute uh, meeting like this, but somehow it has to go on, perhaps behind the scenes.